My dad worked for a medical supply house. He was the finance director of the medical supply house. And one day, he had to go somewhere, and we had a day off of school, and my mother talked him into bringing me with him. And so all the way there, I was getting lectured. Children are to be seen and not heard. Don't bother me. I'm at work. You can come. If you have any questions, you can ask them later. So he pulled up to this low building. It was a one-story building. It was not that huge. And we walked in, and my dad explained to me that the purpose of this building was to house children who were going to die. What I remember walking into was this huge room filled with cribs. I don't remember ever seeing any staff, but I remember how incredibly quiet it was. Nobody was crying, nobody was making any noise. And as I walked by, I, my finger was trailing along the crib, and the little girl grabbed my finger and pressed my finger and smiled. Well, that's all it took. I wanted to run after my daddy and tell him that we had to take this little girl home because my mommy could help her and she wasn't going to die because she could smile and she could hold my finger. And then I race into the next room and I'm in the room now with the four and five year olds. And these are the children who didn't die like they were supposed to. They were in cages. They were literally in cages. And I, I was devastated. They hear are these children in cages that that wasn't right. So we get in the car and he turns on the car and starts to drive away. I'm like, Daddy, Daddy, wait, we can't leave. We have to take these children home. We have to help them. And my dad said, Peggy, you just don't understand, but when you grow up, maybe then you can help children like this. And that's what started me into this career. Cool program, real cool program, and it, it's sort of a symbolic of the uh, transformation in day programs that we're trying to push. First and foremost, I think it's fun, right? Secondly, it's a form of exercise. Third, it's, it's uh, getting in tune with the rhythm. Now understand that some people don't understand spatial relationships with someone raising their arm like this. They've ne never, even thought they could do that or did do that, right? Our objective is to have the people we support do just what you and I do. Steve and I have been married for um, 33 years, and we've had lots of good times, and we've had some bad times. In the past, there was a lot of alcohol abuse, and uh, there was a lot of lost communications, distrust, and dishonesty. Everybody used to say, I wish I had a husband like Steve. I'm like, God, I wish you had now. <laughs> Everyone that comes here has to want to do this for themselves. Sometimes their family, it gets sick and tired of them. We were at the point that I couldn't take it too much more and um, I was so surprised one day when he come home and told me that he had decided to get some help. When I first saw him, he was timid, he was frightened, he was sick. But he came and he sat, he put his listening ears on and he absorbed like a sponge. They believed in me and they knew and they gave me the confidence that I could go back out and face that world. And sometimes it just takes another person to just believe in you until you have the strength to believe in yourself. And to see him from the day he came in till today, that was just like, it was just complete, he looked completely different. When they come here, they get an opportunity to have a new beginning and it's up to them to seize it. I know there's going to be some cloudy days, you know, but when you got the tools and, and you got the support, then you can face those. 
And you were telling me earlier you think you got your husband back. I think I have Steve back. You know, we can't change the past, so we just move on and do better with what we've got. Their life, I think, is much richer by coming here each day. If you ask any of them what they like about their day program or being here, it's going to be their friends, it's going to be the staff. I have an outstanding staff that love what they do. When people walk in, they usually say, everybody seems so happy. And that's always been our goal, you know, to make this a happy place. What do you think these people would be doing if they weren't here in this day program? A lot of them, you know, may just be sitting at home watching TV. Much better to be here? Much better to be here. They, they love it. I mean, they love coming to a day program. They love having things to do and feel worthwhile like we all do. We're more alike than we are different, for sure. When his dad died, before he died, he said, make sure you take care of Tim. My name is Tim Hayes, and I'm 52 years old. So he was living at home, right. and you started to talk to him about, Tim, maybe right. it's time you started to learn how to live by yourself. Right. So uh, take care of yourself. Learn how to cook and shop. OK. And you know, like what everybody else does. My knowledge in generally help the disabled where they can live on their own, give them a sense of independence. He has his own car. Right. And, and he drives. Right. And he has a job. Yes. And he has his own apartment. Right. And he cooks for himself. Not very often. <laughs> <laughs> I cook and he might reheat it. So you do everything for yourself? Yes. He said he works every day, but when he's not working, his other job is to help take care of you. Is that yes, it? yeah, he does. Does he do a good job of that? He sure does. Some people need an extra push, helping hand, to have a life for themselves. And you think in your case, Monarch helps you? Yes. I enjoy it. I enjoy seeing what I can do in life. In a way, you get your own life that way too, right? Hey, right. <laughs> I got my own place too. I think it's Daniel Siegel, a neuroscientist, who talks about what happens when we get under stress. And he says, just imagine that this is your brain. And this is the frontal lobe, which is responsible for higher level processing, considering consequences and things like this. And you can just imagine my thumb right there in the center of the brain is the brain stem, which is responsible for fight, flight, where the amygdala is. And so when we're under stress, we flip our lid we lose touch with our most important resources and we're operating out of this small brain that's fighting, frozen, trying to grasp at controlling the experience. 
when sometimes when we're under stress, we don't have any control over what's going on. Because if we did, we'd just solve the problem. So stopping, pausing in this way, opens us up to more solutions because we re-engage the full capacity of what it means to be creative, to solve problems. Mindfulness has to do with um, staying in the present. We say that anxiety is someone that worries about the future. Depression is someone that worries about the past. So you can see very simply how staying in the present and not worrying about the future, i.e. causing anxiety, or worrying about the past, regrets, depression, can keep you on track. You think of the ocean. The ocean is vast and deep, but we get caught up in paying attention to all the waves, a thought, a feeling. Well, if we really stop and pay attention, we'll notice that the thoughts and feelings come and go. That if we're really being non-judgmental, we become to realize that I'm actually not my thoughts. I'm actually not my feelings. They are things that I'm just experiencing. So if we're managing our stress better, we're probably managing every aspect of our lives better. So I don't look at mindfulness just as an intervention for folks who have mental illness, depression, bipolar, but for anyone, because we all have stress in our lives and we could all benefit by paying attention a little bit more, slowing down, being patient, perhaps being grateful or being friendly and non-judgmental to ourselves. This is the kitchen. This is the kitchen. I noticed that he was getting older. And I, I felt like it was time for him to learn to be a little more independent. That's heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. Sat him down and I said, Terrence, um, you know, you're getting older. And uh, suppose something happened to mom. I mean, I, I want to make sure you're in a a good place. Because naturally you want to protect them forever. So you, you know, cutting the cord, let them move out, live, huge leap of faith. I said, you sure you ready? And you're like, yeah, mom, I'm ready. I'm ready. I was like, okay, well, you, are you sure? I mean, because you know, it was kind of hard to let go. If that's what they want, if that's what the parents want, right? Just like our teenage sons, when they get to be 18 or 19, etc., they they leave the home, life. Most people don't live with their parents for their whole life. And the next thing I know, I got a phone call. Would you like to come for a visit at our group home? I think we might have a spot for Terrence. So I was like, okay, already? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Tears started falling, but I knew I was doing the right thing. I had to entrust my child to any organization. What a huge leap of faith that would be. Um, and it's always fulfilling afterwards when the, when the child or the adult gets in our homes and our home becomes their home. No regrets about the decision you made? None. None. You do it again tomorrow? Yes, I will. I really will. I was nervous for him and scared and proud. Mm -hmm. All those emotions rolled in at once and when I brought his things here and his clothes and all his little knickknacks, his books and everything. Oh, I just, I just, tears just came down and I knew my baby's growing up and sometimes growing up means you have to let go. Nothing just means that sometimes.
Usually the reaction is when they walk into the room, they see a 32 inch monitor and they kind of look at the staff and the nurse and say, what's this? Um, then when you start speaking, saying, and typically I, I'm Dr. McHale, I'm a board certified psychiatrist. I'll be talking to you for about 30 minutes or so. I want to find out where I can help you. And the person goes, oh, they're here to help. I had a patient whose sister died suddenly yesterday, and she was so uh, grief-stricken and needed to see someone right away to get medication. She had to identify the body, and I was able to see her this morning. The, the patient, who especially is in a more rural community, the access to doctors that normally would never occur. So I thought initially this was going to be um, a real hurdle, not having the patient face to face. But uh, surprisingly, it's working quite well. Freud always said we should be a blank screen. So having the telepsychiatry actually provides the blank screen needed. And I find that patients are more open and, and very quick to go to the root cause of their conflicts. Technology allows us to go to places we haven't gone. Technology allows us to learn things that we only had in theory. But what makes it a good patient-physician relationship is I want you to do well. I want you to be healthy, and this is my recommendation. Sarah comes once a week and she sweeps our porch for us sometimes. Um, she might dust our furniture, clean mirrors, just you know, do whatever little chores we ask her to do. And I'm sure she does this to get paid, right? No, that's all pure volunteer. She has been doing Meals on Wheels about a year. She's been a volunteer at East Almar School for a number of years. She wants to give back, and she has been given the opportunity to give to others. I think she would miss it if she did not do it every day. And you like helping other people? Yeah. That makes you yeah. feel good? Yeah, I feel good. We all want to be needed. We all want to be useful. You make a lot of people happy. Yes. That make you happy? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I make me happy. This is uh, an expressive arts therapy group. We like to provide a variety of art materials and allow people to just explore the creative side and using colors and images and shapes to represent thoughts and feelings and issues. So let's come to the point where we're going to talk a little bit about what everybody did. And you can say as much or as little as you want to about your work. You know, I as the therapist can talk to them about different ways of thinking, behaving, or looking at a situation, but for someone to hear from another person that also suffers from depression, or bipolar, or anxiety, that's huge because then they stop feeling alone. I'm a leaf floating down the stream, and I'm relaxing. Usually the people that are trained artists are really bad at art therapy. It's the people that have the least experience with art that generally provide the most information, that there's the most content in their work. Oh, and here's the rapids. I forgot to tell you yeah, about the rapids. I see. That's life. <laughs> I know, sometimes we do enter the rapids, don't we? <laughs> That's life. <laughs> We're known for doing things that are really cutting edge, but we don't do things that are not recognized as having a result. Evidence-based means that it's been tested, proven, and tried to work. We are really able to have the tools now to study the brain in much more detail than it was in the past. They were able to interview over 150 monks 
who did mindfulness and meditation exercises and they found that they were able to reduce their blood pressure without medication. And science has shown through uh, research on the brain, now that we can image the brain, how it affects the brain after eight weeks of mindfulness meditation. Many of the evidence-based practices that we use are what we call manualized. So if someone's written a book or written a manual on how exactly you do this treatment the way that it was designed to do. Science is rarely simple, but any good scientist has to admit what they don't know in order to discover anything new. He can make a mean burrito. <laughs> That's for sure. I was out of work for like six years. And Tim came to me because, you know, he's in, in search of a job. And then I started going to Monarch through a program that they have to put you back to work. Tim and I got together and we could, you know, did job applications. We went around to local restaurants and we, you know, completed applications. Oh man, she's awesome. She uh, helped me go on the interview. She took me to the interview. She picked me up. Anything that I asked her to do, she would, she would do it for me. And he went in and they liked him and he came out and they were happy with him and they wanted to hire him. The first thing you see when he walks in the door, he's just smiling, you know. Walks in the door, ready to go, always in a good mood. Now you can't say that about all your employees, can no, you? No, I can't say that about myself. <laughs> I will say this, I think one misconception is that people think that if they hire somebody with a disability, they're doing it for charity, you know, they're assuming the person can't do the same job that a person without a disability, and that's absolutely not true. I'm the burrito man. Don't nobody make burritos with Tim. He's the spoon that stirs the pot. He is very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Life is messy. It's not easy. Uh, people die. People get injured. People have traumas that happen to them. Monarch is about helping people in need. To become the best version of themselves that they can be. We'll help someone learn how to, to groom themselves, how to dress themselves. I would have had to quit my job if it wasn't for Monarch and the Center Here Today program because um, she just couldn't have gone anywhere else. You know, you have to be, you have to be comfortable when leaving your, your child. I know that if things aren't going right or if there's a problem <laughs> or something, all I have to do is call. It's, it's a good and, call. And, yeah. <laughs> they it's will a take good care call. Of it. We um, help people get jobs. We help them gain self-respect. We teach them ways to live independently. We're seeing people with disabilities as people first. That's why at Monarch we refer to them. They're not our clients, they're not our patients, they're not consumers, they're people, right? We're taught to recognize when somebody's being discriminated against and in a very nice and professional way, try to uh, change that person's mind. Monarch is the urgent care of mental illness. An individual in the community can come into any of our offices and be seen by a therapist and a psychiatrist in that given day. I get phone calls all the time. I got one yesterday from a mom who said, I don't know what to do with my daughter. She's really violent. She's 18. I don't know where to turn. No one can help me. What do I do? And by the time we were done with that phone call, mom felt better. Mom had direction. And the daughter today is getting some help. The goal of treatment is to find out what the patient's goal is and to work with the patient so that they can achieve their goals. It's better that we don't have an agenda for the patient but that we help the patient understand what they want. As long as the person that's coming has the will, then Marat can help them make it come true. Today, Brian Gaskin awakened to his 10,317th day of total darkness and total silence. And in those days, he's never seen a ray of sunshine, and he's never heard a bird sing. He's never heard his mother say, I love you. Yet he's a very happy young man 
who communicates with tactile sign language and can communicate with the caregivers who love him so much. And that's what Monarch's doing for us. We help people that thought they could never achieve something to achieve it. Certainly we help people get well, but we also help people have a quality of life that they never even knew they could reach. That's what Monarch does. I knew a parent who happened to have five children with disabilities, and he worked in a factory with his buddies, right? And he went in one day and said, hey, my, my son just learned to tie his shoe. Huge deal from him. And his, his buddy said, yeah, how old's your kid? And the dad said, my son's 38. That center still exists today. There aren't five-year-olds in there anymore. There aren't even children in there anymore. Now it's a program that's much more progressive and works with people in the community. Well, good thing your dad took you there. I think so. Yeah, I think so, too. Changed my life. And a lot of others. Thanks.